Good? Excellent. So, under the hood, all the magic in Cisco technology, all the reference architectures and bombs, unfortunately it is under NDA. But I will try to provide you as much information as possible about reference architectures, how to make OpenStack HA, the bells and whistles and magic that makes InterCloud unique, and the platform of choice. I thought I'd start today actually just by showing you one of our sites. So this is actually our site running in Texas. We have several sites running in Texas. And it's actually, uh, let me just increase the brightness here. I don't know if that will control. Or mine, I don't know if it controls this. So th this is actually our live site. I can spin up thousands, tens of thousands of VMs and workloads. I have full storage access built on standardized infrastructure. Like we have, I think, 10 racks, all with you know SSDs and a whole bunch of volumes for massive volume storage. You can build networks. It's all under the hood is all of our switch fabric, and I'll dive into that. And it's live today, globally. So we have Telstra, DT, BT. We have multiple sites in America today. Um, this is Texas 3. We also have one, two, and about several internal sites that we use for CI, CD, and testing. So um, our goal of InterCloud is really hyperscale cloud, and I'll kind of dive into the details of what we're looking at, some reference architecture in OpenStack. So what we're really looking at is I have some kind of salesy type, salesy type lingo here, but really it's the, you know, I use the under the hood and the vehicle analogy to really be, you know, it's the embodiment and it's the platform for delivering your solutions globally. Whether it's private cloud, whether it's public cloud, wh whether it's a combination of Azure, AWS, and vCloud Air, how do I connect all of that together to really bring value to my business, to my customers, and also build the platform and the tools on top of that to make my life easier in delivering solutions and value proposition. So what we're really looking at is, you know, some abstraction words. I won't dive into the details specifically, but really we want to abstract complexity. We, we want to uh, provide extensibility and productivity for mobile, mobility, uh, you know, CMX. Uh, you guys have seen Cisco Spark. Cisco Spark is running on our cloud, right, and delivering those, you know, applications, SaaS, PaaS, IaaS applications to deliver value. Uh, of next leading edge solutions. We also want to have intelligence, right, which kind of opens the door to AI on cloud, cloud robotics, a whole bunch of other really innovative things. Uh, for example, using closed loop analytics, I can pull data from the cloud, pass it through some AI, and then make decisions, right, reroute traffic, move workloads around. Um, also, we want to be, you know, efficient. In a global workload, we have power, and power floods into our, our data centers, and you know, that's an, a hurdle that we have to overcome because if I have to move power to my data center and there's an outage or a power outage or a brownout or, a, you know, in this, you know, any kind of flooding or hurricane or typhoon or earthquake, how does it affect my global availability and resiliency models? But at the same time, I can't put workloads all over the world without an efficiency model because that's, that's money, right? And if I'm going to deliver a cheap, cost-effective solution with value to my customers, how do I do that? In, in a scalable and efficient way. So there's some um, ideas that I'm going to breeze over, but really it's the idea that we want to know how your data flows across the cloud, across multiple cloud environments. We, we want it to be uh, a platform of security, efficiency, and scalability for these uh, technologies. We, we want it to be easy to consume so that you can go in and you can build your apps and be the platform of choice for app developers, whether it be Python, containers, Kubernetes, Mesos, all these, uh, and we also want you to s leverage hyperscale. Like, how do I, you know, I was speaking with uh, a gentleman last night, and they're doing rendering, massive rendering for, uh, you know, all of their movies. You know, digital rendering for uh, various animated movies, for example. And the idea is, as the complexity of my rendering and technology increases, how do I build a technology on top of a platform that can scale as complexity increases, right? I can do a one cloud, I can get lock-in, I can say, I'm gonna do rendering for 50,000 VMs. Well, that's great today, but three years from now, it's not gonna be okay. It's gonna be you know, X to the power of three. How do you build a technology and choose a cloud platform that can scale to that so you're not you know, locked in by geography or technology or APIs? So what we, we really want to look at, you know, control and abstraction. What, what, what are the ways that I can interact with cloud that helps me drive data and control my cloud to get what I want out of it? 
Thedia is simply we have portals of consumption. We have portals for marketplace, which we have a demo over there. We have portals for applications and services. We have portals for uh, NSV and some of our advanced network functions and services. You have marketplaces for consuming applications, federated marketplaces, you know, AWS is a marketplace, you know, vCloud is a marketplace. How do we consume our applications and services? We want open APIs. I want to be able to move my application to any cloud vendor in the world, whether it be Hyper-V, vCloud Air, ESXi, uh, or OpenStack, or a few others. But how do I do that, right? And when we talk about hyperscale and these massive workloads in computation, or IoT, IOE, Internet of Everything, where I'm pulling data from sensor networks in the ocean, or um, you know, from, sense from blinds, or from thermostats, we're aggregating all the data, trying to do something interesting, we don't want to say, oh, I hit a barrier, I can't go any further. And now I have to re-engineer, re-architect, re-choose, rethink, readjust my business model to try to adjust to this barrier that I've reached. The idea is it's you know, elastic globally, and you want to have the scale openness of your API so you can build your intelligent applications. Then, of course, you have these services and agents. They're VMs, there's applications, there's services running under the cloud, in the cloud, cloud robotics, intelligence, AI, that are doing abstract complexity for you. For example, I have a load balancer. I want that load balancer to auto scale for me without me having to worry about it. You know, all of a sudden I get a massive influx of, of you know, data into my uh, e-commerce application. Say I'm running eBay or a comparable application that I run, you know, Airbnb. And based on a time of day or based on some uh, event that happens in the world that could be unpredictable, say, Airbnb just releases this really awesome Super Bowl commercial, and now, you know, I get this a full 30%, 300%. How do I deal with that? Is it something I have to worry about, or is it something the cloud can provide for me? And with these agents and services running under and in InterCloud, it provides that abstraction and complexity for you. Right? So what we also have is here's some examples of portals. Uh, this portal is actually from Telstra. Our Telstra data center, they have their own branded portal for our cloud. They have, can access all regions within InterCloud. This is our older US Texas portal that can access similarly. And the idea is that you know, we're going to build these ways that are standardized to interact with services and compute and technology that make it easier to consume for those who want those kinds of ways of interacting. Other ways that we can do, we can use APIs. As the, the, the session before, you can use APIs for interacting with the core services. OpenStack, open APIs across the board, what we want to do is use OpenStack as a platform to allow you to build portable applications. You know, wrap OpenStack on top of AWS or VMware. Make that the open standard APIs, right? And so here, um, I'm doing a federated identity through command line. I'm saying, this, this is me, this is my project that's living in this cloud, authenticate me, and then I want to you know, use that token of authentication to access all these resources over here, right? We have block storage, compute, we have data processing, database, identity, image services, networking, object. These are all open APIs that I can then use to build my services. OpenStack uses the same APIs under the hood to do the same thing you're doing, so you can go as deep down into the depths of OpenStack as you want to build your tightly coupled solutions and highly optimized, or you can abstract that away with any kind of complexity that you desire. So what we're really looking at is now that I have these ways of interacting, how do I know what's happening? What's my operational model? How do I deal with changing events, right? So we have logging, utilization, time metrics, big data, anomaly detection, right? I'm building my applications, but I want to monitor my applications. I want to, I want to monitor my infrastructure. I want to know that the resources being provided to me are the resources that I, I need, I want, and I ask for. And more importantly, with those resources over time, Am I guaranteed? How, what's the fluctuation of events in the world that affect me and my business and my way of interacting with that business? Right. So basic architecture, very common. Uh, Zeus is over there, which is what, what one of the technologies we use. We have lots of different logging and metrics and monitoring analytics. You know, common. You can use Elk Stack for logging and a bunch of other things. You know, you have Apache Storm, Kafka, a bunch of other tools that you can use to do this infrastructure monitoring. But really what it is, it's I want a services, applications, my data path, my physical devices, and my resources. I want to put that into a data bus that I can just pull data from and consume in various big data and analytics services. I might want to run the uh, analytics on different parts of the data, right? I want to rerun it on network, rerun it on compute object storage. I want to pull different, I want one to be price and outputs and capex. 
the other one to be utilization and consumption and availability. Right. This all pulls up into visualization and alerting, you know, and it gives you that comprehensive perspective of how am I doing, what's happening, what, what affects my business. So what that really means is that complexity is pushed into two levels. Number one is our infrastructure, what we operate. And number two, it's also provided to you as a consumer. So you can say, I'm gonna build my applications, I know how my infrastructure is doing, and I know how my services are doing. Right? That gives you intelligence to do some very cool cloud robotics type things. Right? And what you get is a single pane of glass. You get your projects and tenants, you get your VMs and virtual resources, it could be your containers, and you also get your dashboard to understand what's happening, and you get your alerting and triggers and stuff like that. So what you also want to do is you want to be resilient, built tough. How do we build it tough so that when we run workflows that we can be resilient and available? So you have resiliency models, which is to say active-active, you know, active-passive, standby, et cetera. You have NFV service chaining. You have service intelligence. You have availability of regions and zones in multi-data center. GSLB, global service load balancing using DNS services to say, you know, I have a maintenance window, but I want to clone my services, and I want to redirect traffic across a new data center to make sure that my services are available, right? 99.999% available. That's a very tough problem. That works down to like a minute a year of downtime. How do you do that in OpenStack? Very tough problem. But it really looks at you know, some basic architectures. I kind of quickly drew this up. It's really what you want to do is in the control layer, you want to have multiple uh, cloned services. OpenStack is relatively stateless. You have some back-end stateful services like your database and your message queue. And you can actually make those very resilient by using hardware and data replication and things like that. But what you want to do on your services, you want to have HA proxy or some other load balancer to load balance your core services. Inside of OpenStack, I haven't drawn here, you have internal load balancing. And then your compute could use like cells in OpenStack or other kinds of services to be, do clustering and things like that to, to make your OpenStack resilient. Right? Uh, under the hood, you have UCS. I'm not going to go into detail, but we have UCS, uh, C series, B series to get your different you know, data density and your compute workloads, et cetera. You can use your basic ASR series, Nexus 9K, ACA Fabric to get your basic networking footprint. What you really want is you know, networking topologies that make sense for cloud, such as a clause topology. Why clause? Clause was and wasn't, and now it is, again. And what that means is clause topology give you kind of this huge pipes, non-blocking, multi-path, you know, high, high resiliency model for east-west traffic. If I'm gonna do any kind of data workload that needs a lot of analytics or east-west traffic, right, I, I wanna not go all the way up to you know, my, my routers or infrastructure to do north-south. I wanna go east-west, high availability, low latency, high computation, but still have the path egress out where these lines are going for egress traffic multi-data center with fiber optic backbones and things like that. Right, and what you really look at in terms of OpenStack, I won't try to, OpenStack is not a nice looking thing to look at from an architecture perspective. But what should be illustrated by this is a bunch of services. We have a queue, um, we have uh, Cinder, I can't really read, it's a bit small. Cinder, we have our block and object storage, we have a message bus here, um, we have our hypervisors, right? We have our scheduler, we have our keystone identity service. They all communicate through the same APIs that are exposed to you northbound, right? You build in um, and you also have Horizon for your dashboard. They all communicate internally. This well, you know, structured, there's lots of work in this area that we, we can dive really deep into. Um, the important thing to note that there are components and pieces, they're interchangeable and interoperable. They have different versions of APIs that can be integrated. You can run an older version of Keystone with a newer version of Neutron to leverage a unique capability or bug fix. So if a particular newer version of Neutron has a bug fix in it, I might have to go back to an older version of Neutron unless I work upstream to push that inside. So there's lots of complexity with artifact versioning, what OpenSAC goes where, what APIs are interoperable, what service do I build that satisfies my use cases and resiliency models, right? So um, if any of you are not too familiar with OpenSAC, I'll be happy to provide you more detail later. Come up and I can do a deep dive. I have a VM running that can you know, you can use all your APIs to interact. I can show you how that works. So now, intercloud, right? We, we have this OpenStack model. 
This is a data center running clause topology, UCS, Nexus 9K, all this magic under the hood, source fire, security appliances, um, security policies, et cetera, anti-spoofing rules. Now, what do I do with it, right? That's a data center. That's my one region or availability zone. Now I want multi-zone, multi-availability region. What we do is we move to this idea of intercloud. You might have been hearing about intercloud fabric. You might be hearing about intercloud. Two different things. But what intercloud is, is a technical alliance of vendors or providers, Telstra, DT, BT, who are choosing to share their OpenStack platform with each other. But what that means is, is you say, I, I have an availability zone or a region in Brazil, right? And I am a small, a small provider, right? And, but I want hyperscale cloud. How do I do that? I, I say, I will offer my resources to all other providers, Telstra, DT, BT, right? I will, you can spin up any workload you want, but in exchange, I get to run any of my customer workloads on your environments, right? So it's like a federated roaming, cell phone roaming model. It allows me to roam my cell phone anywhere in the world with no increased cost to me, right? And you also get scale and availability, right? So what happens here then is this notion I can do very powerful things. For example, based on time of day, if I run a workload in Asia versus a workload in you know, North America, there's a different time zone, meaning the contention for resources in a data center would either be greater or less, right? People are asleep. We might not be using as much resources in that cloud. That means I can scale down. Resources in US might be daytime. Therefore, they might be scaled up. So what I can do is, is then I might want to, with a latency hit, redirect traffic to a data center that's underutilized, right? if there's contention for resources for my own. Or maybe I want to burst data via disaster recovery to a different data center outside of the impact zone that I might be experiencing, right? There might be something bad happening here, there might be a new law, a new geopolitical issue I'm dealing with which may affect consumption, and I wanna shift data and workloads and resources to different regions based on reduced cost. I don't want cost, right? I want a more value, more capability, lower cost. That's the idea of intercloud. So scaling capacity, how do we do that? You know, the horsepower or torque of your car, how do we translate that into capacity planning, capacity management under the hood, right? New global data centers, upgrades and enhancements, we want to retrofit. Hardware gets old. We need to retrofit even Cisco hardware as new technologies emerge, like ACI, for, for example. How do we deal with these kinds of challenges, right? So, you know, you, we have our hardware, that's great, but how do, we auto, well, how do we scale out, right? So the way we design our infrastructure is that you can scale two ways. The first way is you can scale vertically with density, Right? The idea is before you have a server that can run 20 VMs and we call it good. Now it's you want to run 100 VMs. Right? For every increased density of a VM per blade or server, that is that much more contention for the fiber optic backbone of your server. Right? It's more heat, it's more power. How do you plan for that? So you can scale vertically. You know, our work is to I can add more servers, I can retrofit the servers with new kinds of versions to increase density of VMs. I can increase influx power and AC to adjust to that dynamically. At the same time, I want to be able to, as I scale up my cloud, I want to scale up my cloud horizontally, right? OpenStack is, consists of controllers and compute. Compute's what's interesting, that's where I run my workloads. So control doesn't really have to scale. You know, like that's contention for bandwidth on your management network. Right? And you're not going to saturate that link because it could be 10G. Right? That's, that's massive for how many OpenStack messages are required to orchestrate a workload. But what you do want to do is you want to scale out the number of compute capacity you have in a data center. You don't want to have to do another greenfield, build another data center. You just want to increase the number of racks across that. Okay? So vertical, horizontal. Right? And under the hood, you also want to leverage new technologies like ACI. Now that you have scale out, how does your network increase capacity? Do I have to re-rack and stack switches? Do I have to add new cables to increase the pipes? Well, you can use QoS, you can use policy management, you can use more intelligent network design using something like ACI to redirect traffic across switches instead of saturating your tours, right? Or east-west traffic local instead of going all the way to the tour or beyond the tour, right, your, your core network. So there's ways that you can optimize that with more intelligent networking and policy. 
then that's within a data center. Now what you want to do is increase capacity globally, build new data centers. We have racks, data centers, network fabric, and now multi-data center, right? And now you can increase capacity in a region by building new data centers. We just built a brand new one, US Texas 3 I just showed you at the beginning. You'd also increase capacity globally, and then what you want to do is you want to stitch these all together through high bandwidth fiber optics so the latency is minimal, because now I can almost treat another data center globally as my own capacity. It's almost you know, negligible for the, the latency and the capacity increase I get. So I can talk a little bit about security. You know, security is a contentious thing. The reason why it's a contentious thing is because, well, cyber attacks happen. I would admit to you that we're not immune. It happens to us all the time. But we have the tools and technologies to mitigate it. IPS, IDS, deep packet inspection, DDoS mitigation, load balancing, web application firewalls. These are the technologies living under the hood within the fabrics and technologies we're using with policy to mitigate any kind of cyber attack both to our tenant VMs, to our infrastructure, and core services. Right? But if I were to tell you, I would be exposing attack vectors, which I can't do. Under NDA, sure. I can put an NDA up and you can sign it, but that wouldn't work. So what we have here is, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about ways you can harden OpenStack. One is KVM and emulation. There's lots of works and tweaks you can do with configuration, with KVM deployment, to harden the kinds of attacks you can do on VMs. For example, on VMs, you can do something called VM thrashing, which is the idea that on a VM, I can spin up a CPU cycle to 100% utilization, and what happens is the VM crashes and thrashes the hypervisor. And what that does is, for a snippet, a small point in time, I can actually see what another tenant VM is actually running on the hypervisor virtual CPU and the physical CPU. You can also do things like, if I spin up a workload on a VM, I can affect your utilization. And what I can do is, I can force your VM to migrate. And if I do that across the region, I can force all of your VMs to constantly move, which basically is an internal DDoS on your own service without me doing any networking. And there's botnets and services that do this today. And what you want to do is you want to harden the hypervisor, mitigate this by VM-centric policies and various other things to prevent that from happening. You also want to harden APIs with WAFs. There's very common uh, RESTful API attacks, right? I can use a security token. I can brute force that in OpenStack. How do we protect that, right, based on patterns and analytics? How, how do we do secure you know, messaging and things like uh, SE Linux, right, where we want to monitor all processes running on that host. So if I can compromise a VM, can I compromise your host, right? It's all networking. If I can ping your host gateway IP, then I could potentially SSH into your host box. Now I've compromised the host, and that leads to a new attack vector across my infrastructure. There are lots of different attack vectors you have to harden again. Of course, secrets. No one wants to hard good secrets. So really is uh, a variety of things. We want monitoring. We have a team doing persistent monitoring and querying for vulnerabilities in tenant VMs and infrastructure. We have granular ACLs, a lot of firewall rules and analytics. Um, we have I network isolation models to say, if you are, have a project on OpenStack, I do not want your project to ever be able to be routed in the same VRF as another tenant or various other models, right? And across multi-data center, that's challenging because how do you burst that out globally across the fiber, right? And use IPsec tunnels, VPN, what's your, your mechanism of isolation? VLANs, VXLAN, uh, extended VXLAN, I mean, that's where ACI comes into play to give you that multi-tenancy uh, multi and isolation. So I'll kind of skip this. We're working in IEEE, IETF. We want things to be standardized and open. We're incubating new projects in OpenStack to bring new capability, because the more we incubate new projects, I just had a conversation this morning with an, uh, another gentleman on uh, incubating a brand new project into OpenStack that will basically give you multi-cloud peering, right, to enable you to, from hybrid cloud use case, to burst your workloads from hybrid cloud, from a private cloud to a public cloud, Th things like that, extending the ecosystem. You also want to build tools. So with all this complexity and interoperability and tool chains, how do I get started? How do I map my business need and my new capability and my business model into what is cloud? So we want to provide you the tools, the training, and the capability, and the mechanisms so you can say, 
I have this business process, this is the way I do it today, here's the migration path to cloud, this is how I get there, and this is how I automate it, and you'll help me get there. So that's really all I have. Um, this is an old agenda, you know, the concept car, under the hood, where are we going? You can really think of it as a massive, global, autonomous cloud, right? Abstracts complexity, gives value, all the building abstraction, so you just have to say, this is what I want, this is how I'm gonna get there, I just have to click a button and get it. And if I wanna innovate, it's a platform of innovation. So okay, thank you. Um, I'll be up here for any questions, be over there at the, the demo booth a little bit more, and thank you.